Um, how, who has not found this scenario? You come into work clinically, and the, the place is a mess. The patients are hanging from the ceiling, and you say to your huck or your chargers or whatever, what's going on here? And they say, oh, Bill and Jim are working, or oh, Dave and Sherry are working, or whoever are the, are the slower docs, right? Isn't this the state of, of emergency medicine? We have so much practice variation, and if you line up your doctors and nurses and ask them, who's a fast doc, who's a slow doc, won't they agree? We're pretty good at knowing it, right? Sometimes we know it even if we can't define it with numbers. So I find this very fascinating, and I've got, uh, if you'll stay with me, I've got some ideas for how to make each individual doctor more efficient. And then at the end, just a, a very novel way that you might consider taking this variation in efficiency among your docs and playing it out in real life with your scheduling. So neat ideas to present. So today's journey, where I would like to take you in the next 30 minutes, personal best, strategies for the ED, for ED efficiency, how does IT, and what are some of the, the quick wins you can have with your IT system to make you more efficient, and then the concept of green doctors and red doctors. So who saw this article by Atul Gawand? Any Atul Gawand fans in the audience? He's a remarkable physician writer, isn't he? So he put this in, in uh, the New Yorker, an article, and he marveled at the fact that uh, physicians participate in one of the most lengthy and expensive educations of anyone on the planet, especially in the US. And then how do you, how do you start your first job as an ER doc? I don't know about you, but I came to work early. Someone showed me you know, the IT system as it was back then, pretty rudimentary, and said, OK, right? Is that how we orient our physicians, right? We, we really do short shrift in terms of trying to make our docs understand the system and excel within it. Whereas if you look, tennis players, professional tennis players, they constantly have a coach, a professional violinist, so many other endeavors. We don't just leave it be, but don't you feel like that's kind of what happens in healthcare? There you go. And, and there's lots of places to get information on how to be clinically better and keep up to date, but where do you go if you're a doc and you just want to do it better, more efficiently? That's a little bit of a harder task, isn't it? And so I believe the time has come, by the way, for ER efficiency coaches. Come in my system and show me the tricks to make me better. Uh, and like I say, sometimes it's very subtle. Like how, how many of you have been working, seen your, your colleague next to you do something and say, hey Jim, how would you do that? I'm, this happens to me, I'm a night shift worker. I've always been a night, so I don't get to cross paths with, I, we're mostly single covered at night. I don't get to talk to my colleagues much. And we were six months into a new prescription writer, and I said, hey, how'd you get that? No one had ever showed me, and I just kind of learned it on the fly, how to do it a little bit better. So strategies for ED efficiency. There's a handful of them that all of you should employ at the individual level and at the group level. It's very practical. You, oh, you cannot underestimate how much this is your enemy in trying to be efficient at whatever you do. So I want you to take this challenge, I want you to go home, look at your office, and go, oh my gosh, is that an article from Emergency Medicine 1990? Maybe it needs to go, right? Uh, let's, let's get rid of the clutter because this can distract you and it keeps you from being really efficient. Let me just show you this. So can you appreciate, like, look to the far left of the picture. That is a urinal with urinal, urine in it laying across that stand, okay? Now, I grant you, there was a, a critical patient in this room four hours ago, right? Notice the floor, right? Does this look organized? On the other hand, look at this ER. They had a critical resuscitation 30 minutes ago. So part of it is things beyond your control, right? It's culture, it's do you have enough housekeeping and so forth, but I wanna say this has a very different feel to you, to patients, to families, and so forth, than this, right? So getting rid of the clutter and keeping things organized and so forth. Um, like, look at this workspace. And oh, by the way, I looked, and on the wall, one of those little notices were like five years old. What's that doing there? Right, can't you find stuff in your ER? Actually, we found some chest tubes about a month ago that were so old they were crispy. 
they crisp when you tried to bend that chest tube. Uh, but then look at this, right? That looks pretty, pretty organized, pretty, you know, like it might be easy to sit down and do your work. Oops, I'm sorry here. Another strategy that we would borrow from lean manufacturing is this whole idea of touch at once. And it's, this is a challenge to get really good at this in the ER. And this would apply to your nurse as well. Can you see a patient and almost wrap it up with one encounter? Yes, you're gonna go back at least once more to kiss the patient goodbye, as I say. But could you kind of get it organized and kind of wrap it up? I noticed the most efficient guy in my group sees a patient, comes out, does the orders, does the chart, and does his uh, discharge paperwork. What do you think of that? He's getting upstream of it. And oh, by the way, you're very good at that initial blink response of patients. So do a task in one encounter, and this would also mean like when you log on, especially any more double, triple, heaven help me how many logons to get into this computer to look at you know mrs smith's potassium now there's a secret for you right we need to protect that information so going in there and checking all labs at once going in and doing all orders at once and trying to uh, touch it once as they say the other thing is interruptions are our enemy right you know they lead to mistakes we, our practice is fraught with, with interruptions. And it's, I think it's part of our culture, and this is fascinating to me. Okay, so this is a real life case. It's three in the morning, I'm dragging. I'm gonna go to the vending machines and get some caffeine and some sugar, right? And my nurse is walking with me. We have to go out into the, the hallway to get this. And she's telling me about the patient in room six and the family in room six who are quite troublesome. And I go and I'm looking at my big vending machine. I'm just deciding how I'm going to sin here. Will it be a Mars bar or am I going to get some chips, right? And she stops because this is sort of our custom. She understands about interruptions and she's quiet while I'm picking my vending machine, cho my vending choice, right? Think about that. Think how we do. So, uh, we're having conversation. The waiter comes up. We stop while we give our order. You know, in emergency medicine, though, so there she is, completely giving me my space and my quiet and so forth to order that Mars bars. Give me three, right? Uh, but then we go back into the the main ER. I'm on the phone with the consultant. Same nurse shoves a blood gas in my face while I'm talking on the phone, right? Does this happen to you? I think nursing recognized the interruption problem sooner and they began, who remembers when you first saw taped off areas that you weren't supposed to interrupt the nurse when she was getting meds? Now very many have put their medications in a room so you can't interrupt the nurse so she can't make a mistake. But we, we tolerate great interruptions, don't we? Does anybody have a little bubble in their ER they can go to where no one will interrupt you? Or are you fair game anywhere? You're talking on the phone, someone shoves an EKG in front of you, right? It's a very, it's an interesting phenomenon. Does anybody disagree? I think this is just one of those very weird, strange cultural things about emergency medicine. So how can we limit them? And oh, by the way, average ER doc is interrupted 10 times an hour. You've seen some of these studies, there've been several. An ER doc is almost always multitasking. So how often is a doctor who's just in a practice, an office practice, how many times is he interrupted in an hour? Maybe three? Quite a different pace, isn't it? And so I want you to remember that little statistic, you guys. So when you get on the phone, you're like, oh, Dr. Winston, I'm so sorry I kept you waiting. And he says to you, listen, I'm as busy as you are, right? What are you going to say? No, actually, I'm interrupted 10 times an hour and you're interrupted three. That's what you're gonna, like, put him in his place, let him know what, what the deal is. Because the fact of the matter is our work environment is full of interruptions and quite different than any other clinical arena. So how could you limit those interruptions? What are the things that you could do that would be good for you personally and for your department? So some of the, these are some of the strategies First of all, articulate the plan for the team, okay? So that means whether we see it, I mean, my, my best option is I wanna see with my nurse and my tech, the patient. But even if we aren't coordinated to that, say, so Jill, I think this is a gallbladder. I'm getting an ultrasound, but I'm really, I'm so worried if that doesn't show me something, I'm gonna have to CAT scan her because she's, she's got a critical abdomen in my view. So you let them know. You also train them not to interrupt you. In particular, like we had to send out and make it an absolute law that when we're talking to a consultant, no one can shove things in front of us and interrupt the communication. And then 
I do not think you spend enough time on your communication strategy. And actually, Dixon Chung and I have written a paper that was published a couple years ago in the Joint Commission Journal of Quality and Safety, just noticing this and how the fact that we don't manage it, we have lots of interruptions, and the ambient noise level is very high in the ER. You know this. You know that the background noise in the ER is such that you have the same rate of deafness as a rock star. I, sh I picked the wrong career, right? <laughs> I, I, Kiss, are you hiring anyone, right? Uh, I should have been a rock star because the rate of deafness for healthcare workers, especially in the ER, rivals that of people that work around amplifiers all day. Sir? Oh, you're hearing aid. Yeah, actually, we, we laugh. He's sporting one and I am as well, sorry to say. Uh, it's, a, it's an accessory. You know, don't leave home without it, your accessories. Um, so developing a robust communication strategy, and I want you to think about this. Think in your ER. You have three ways in your ER to communicate. Verbal, which I do like the best for most things because 85% of communication is nonverbal. Like, haven't you had this? You come out and you tell Jill, I'm thinking this, and Jill puts her hand on her hip. What's she telling you? She doesn't agree with your plan at all, right? So, and, and I actually, I'll, I'll respond to them. I'm like, why don't you like that? What are you thinking? You know, we're, it's, a, it's a team sport. And seriously, the more we embrace that notion, the better it will be. So you can do verbal or you can do written. And for lots of technical information, written is actually better, isn't it? Lots of data, written communication. Think about in your ER, communicating to the people around you. Or you can do visual signal. Visual signal used to be a bigger part of yours. Who remembers when you knew that labs were back because the chart was paste, placed in this rack? or there's a flag on it, or it was put over here, or they put it on your desk, right, your visual signal. Who knew a patient was ready because there was a light on over the, the room? Anybody remember this? We, in emergency medicine, we really used to use a lot of visual signals. Now what does the visual signal become? It's a, the, a little computer icon, right, that's Lilliputian, it's like tiny. And you might have to scroll through several see, uh, screens to see it. So visual signal is, is much harder than it used to be before we had information technology and EMRs and so forth. So those are your three. And I would challenge you to develop a communication strategy for your department. And you're going to, you would start by prioritizing these are considered emergent communications, these are urgent, these are non-urgent, these are routine and decide how will you will communicate this information. The worst thing you can do is have everything become an overhead. I'm, we, need a, we need a stroke team in room one. That's fine, but how about this? We need an EKG in room one, overhead page. We need respiratory, because what starts to happen, you stop hearing it, don't you? And it's too much ambient noise. So I would challenge you, because I don't think we spend enough time on it, yet, when I've gone into ERs and we've cleaned up the communication, First thing people say is, it's so quiet. It's so quiet here. It has kind of a calming effect, and now every, all the communication is systematic. We always do this. And mind you, now you have the beauty of dedicated cell phones that you can text to, right? So you might say, that I will page you overhead when it's a code. Beyond that, no overhead pages. Anybody think that's right? I think that's right. Okay? It's life-threatening. You know, ESI 1, I need you in the room now, overhead page. Everything else will communicate with text, with phone calls, with pages, with, you know, uh, putting it on a tracking system, something like that. At Intermount, when we developed our own tracking system, we developed an icon that was a bug. It looked like a bug. It looked like a bug. And when there was a lab value that was out of, out of line, out of range, or an abnormal x-ray, or anything that the staff wanted us to know, they put a bug, and it became part of our lexicon. So I'm walking through the ER, Jill, what's the bug in room 10? A potassium of 1.6, oh my god, right? So we, we, we got conditioned, I can't see that icon without getting nervous, right? That little bug on the computer. So think about your, your system. The other thing that's interesting when you're thinking about your communication is, does it go one to one, right? Because there's lots of communication that you need just you to one other person. Is it one to many? And then you can stratify verbal, written, visual signal. By the way, if anybody wants that paper, I'm just cheeky enough to email it to you if you'd like it in PDF. It's all about doing communication, setting up a strategy in your ER to reduce noise and to, to standardize how you do things. 
But who, who's all here? I'm just interested. Who remembers flags on a chart, the chart being moved, a cue on a whiteboard? Anybody, right? The, the good old days, huh? Because you know what? You saw those. Now you, you do realize so much information is missed because it's a little cue. I had a guy with a pneumothorax. In the old days, the radiologist actually might have walked over or called me. Now with our bigger systems, he's reading in a different facility. He just put in the reading that the guy had pneumothorax. No cue came with it. And I almost sent him out the door with his pneumothorax, by the way. So you'll design your communication strategy, and the, the more uh, common uh, modes of communication are, are there listed for you. All right, so prompts and reminders. How much can you can you put in your short-term memory? How many items can you put in your short-term memory? Like right now, if I gave you uh, some information to put in your head, how many things can you remember? Who said 20? I wish I could. Maybe you can. They say seven. They say seven. So what do you think about an ER? And this, is, this is actually was a true place at ER that I was just appalled. So when a phone call came in for a doctor, the page would go out overhead, a very noisy place, as you can imagine. Dr. Welch, you have a call. Pick 56243. 56243. Wait, I can only keep two more things in my head. I got to dial the phone to get my call, but now I can't remember what I called for, right? Can you see that? And so I said, okay, first thing, it's going to be Dr. Welch, call 92, right? Not pick. And yet there are very many ERs that are fraught with these kinds of constraints to good communication. So think about that, seven things in your short-term memory at once, my friends, and wh how much can you overload, and there, thence the need for prompts and reminders. Oh, by the way, there's a study that shows if the, the paramedic gives a report, they did it with nurses, it would look the same with doctors, I'm sure, they give a report, and five minutes later, ask for that information back, they, they can remember 49 to 57% of it. We're like a little brain sieve, aren't we? So we need to rely on prompts and reminders to help us keep track. Um, I will tell you a sign of a good, a good communication ER versus a bad, all right? And you tell me whether this would be true at your place. So when I'm in an ER, and I do a lot of observational studies of ERs, and I hear a nurse say to the doctor, Dr. Welch, what are we doing in room three? I consider that to be evidence of a complete breakdown in communication in that department, right? We are a team, and that nurse should know what we're doing in room three. And if she doesn't know, I probably haven't told her, right? I haven't said, Jill, I'm getting an ultrasound. If it's normal, I gotta get that CAT scan. So think about if I have done that, now our next exchange is, Dr. Watts, the ultrasound's normal. Do you want me to put in the abdominal CT? Oh, Jill, yeah, thanks, thanks, great. Let's get that in, let's get that ordered. Don't you like it? Don't you see how that is a, a much more efficient way of communicating when we're sort of sharing? So I don't want, I, I never want to hear, Dr. So-and-so, what are we doing with room? Because she's not on my team then and she doesn't know what I'm doing with my, my patients and she should know. So with good communication, she does. So other strategies for improving efficiency at the individual level. First, running the board. Actually, you can do this as a department as well. So most electronic uh, tracker systems, you can uh, filter it for your patients, right? So filter the patients, run down. In particular, you're going to look who's been here more than six hours. You should have automatic sort of time intervals that you consider critical. Who's had an x-ray order for an hour and it's not back? who's had a nursing order for 30 minutes and it's not back. You see what I'm getting? You're looking at where there's process delays and trying to run the board. Who's, who might be going home? Who do I need to get upstream on admission? So running the board periodically. That should be part of your practice. Oh, by the way, the department should be doing it too, running the board and watching for flow issues, right? How many of you run the board routinely in your practice? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, then teeing up the discharges. So you're waiting for one thing. You know that person's going to go home once you have that piece of information. Can you just get everything ready for that patient? So teeing up the discharges and getting all that ready. And I, wanted to have, I want to encourage you to have confidence in this. Anybody read the book Blink? Right? It, and it's about the fact that people <laughs> develop expertise in their field. They give examples of physicians at how good we are in the first very brief encounter at assessing things. And you know what a good experienced ER doc, really good at sick, not sick, 
go stay, uh, gonna die. Oh, by the way, there's a couple of studies that are fascinating that show that you are very good almost at like looking at a patient. Maybe you don't know what to call it, but you know sick when you see it. You know circling the drain when you see it. So have some confidence in that blink response because it's not gonna do you wrong. Most patients after your first brief encounter, which according to Utah Medical Insur uh, Insurance Association is about 180 seconds, not very long, you'll be, have a sense of whether that patient's sick, not sick, gonna go, gonna stay, and can you get the paperwork done. And here's a great resource that we, we frequently overlook, and that is the data, which now everybody's kind of got big data, yeah? Do, who could not tell me how many patients their doctors individually see a day, what the lengths of stay, can anybody not tell me that? See, we all have this kind of data, whereas when a lot of the uh, started in this room, you know, you were doing this data by hand if you, if you could get it. So now you have this kind of efficiency data, however you want to manner, measure it, RVUs, patients, probably, you know, you could, we could debate how do you measure efficiency. But you can look at your data and tell a lot about a patient's practice. I, I was uh, at Intermountain, I've been at Intermountain since the 90s, so I have always had great data. I could tell on a doctor, <laughs> how many patients they saw, how long it took, how long to get in the room, how many life -like calls they took, how many ICU admissions they did, how many LPs they did last year. You know, I, could, I had a robust data set that would sort of describe a physician's practice. And in particular, I, I used it in studying my docs and trying to help them all be as efficient as they could. It's, a, it's really a treasure the information that you have. And in fact, I don't even care if you don't use data. If you just said to your nurses, who are the three most efficient doctors? and went from there. I, 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 honestly, I believe that we can learn from each other and there's so much there. So look at the habits of the most efficient docs in your group. Have the less efficient coach, the le the, I mean the more efficient coach the less efficient. We don't do that, do we? Other, other fields of endeavor do this and yet we don't. And then continually look at your IT. Anybody taken an EMR go live in the last year? How is that for you? It's rough, isn't it? Okay, well, I'm gonna show you something that might, you might really like to take back. So first of all, this is now part of our workflow, isn't it? It is part of our workflow, there's no getting away. It takes 1,500 hours for a clinical provider, physician, to optimize his work in a system. So that means learning how the on-call schedule works and how you get certain tests done, right? There's so many things that are nuanced, right? How I can get a nuke med study after midnight, right? Every, every uh, hospital has its own little idiosyncrasies and it takes that long, which is about a year, isn't it? To get optimized on every aspect of efficiency, including the IT. So I have recommended this and everybody rolls their eyes, but think when you went live with your new EMR, it was so much information, and there was no framework to put it in, right? You, you were trying to learn this stuff. You were probably taught some very nice shortcuts, but you had nothing to embed it in until you didn't learn it. So now aren't you finding, after a few months with the new EMR, you'll, you're picking up little tricks, like, oh, I didn't know you could do that, right? So I've actually encouraged it, and every place that I've recommended has been so excited afterwards. Let's all do the training one more time after about 1,500 hours. Now you've been working with the system for a while. Now you're gonna pick up all of those, oh my gosh, I didn't know you could get to that screen that way, right? And, and for doctors, nurses, everyone, retrain uh, after a year. And, to, and consider, like I would like to see each group that discovers an efficiency tip, share it with your partners. Docs to docs, nurses to nurses, oh, guess what, I found out if you want this, all you have to do is right click here, right? Sometimes it's nuanced and this way we can all move along on the curve. So you're gonna retrain. Couple other things with your computer. Everybody have proximity cards? Have you seen them? Fabulous, just like show your card to the little uh, red light you're on. We need to get rid of these logons. And oh, by the way, they're changing them now. Anybody have this where you gotta change your password and log on every year? I'm like, oh gosh, what was it last year, right? Aren't you like that? I can't, there's, it's impossible. So proximity cards, right, just that's it. Or eventually, I think we'll do biometric ID. Look at my retina and let me on, okay? I'm tired of all this typing at three in the morning. So minimizing that. All right, do you know this? So. You can do an ergonomic logon. 
Anybody snowboarded? I'm a Utah girl. Anybody snowboard? Okay. When you're learning to snowboard, they start you out, they say, run in your stocking feet across the floor and slide. Okay? Just run across your... And do, who remembers this when they started with their snowboard? Or do you like your right foot forward or your left? Okay, you're regular in snowboarding language, or you're goofy. That's how they decide which way you will ride a snowboard with which foot forward. The same thing is true with how you would do a swiping motion or come across the keyboard. So what I want you to do is imagine your keyboard, and can I, 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 ours have to be at least one letter, at least one number, and eight digits long. So let's see, one year I did T, see T on there, the left side of the keyboard, and went five, four, three, two, one, da, 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 right? Because it's ergonomic. I, I like to swipe right to left. I'm right-handed. You might not. Just practice how it is for you. You will, you will see that you have a preference. And do your uh, log on, if you have to type a log on, ergonomically. So do you know what the trouble is? I taught it to all my docs in my group. And now everybody keeps taking my passwords, OK? I'm really pissed off about it, you know? So because I figured I had been sequentially, the next year I was you, six, five, four, three, two, one, you know? The next year I was uh, I, you know? And now somebody's taken my log on. So I'm very a angry about it. But just so you know that there's a way to do this. And I actually, I worked with an oncology clinic that wanted to be more efficient. They liked it so much, everyone changed their passwords and log on, so they were ergonomic. They love it. They felt like it was really worthwhile. And then I mentioned that, that retraining. How many of you at home have one computer screen, uh, at, whether you use a desk, uh, well, with a laptop, you don't have a choice, but with your desktop, one screen? One screen? Who's got two? Who's got three? I actually tried four, but my neck hurt looking up at them. You know every time you add, for sure, you, you become 40% more efficient with a second screen. Uh, Ricky Bucata Jr. taught me that. He's in the back of the room. He's an IT you know, maniac. So I expect that we are going to see almost every workstation in healthcare with at least two screens. I think you should have as many screens as you need to have all the applications open that you routinely use. So they're all open for you and you just traverse through them. Anybody in their ER got two screens? Oh yeah, how about three? Okay, that, that's awesome because it just makes you more efficient. Okay, red doc, green doc, and I've got three minutes to tell you about it. Okay, this, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this hospital. I don't think they'd mind me using their name because they are so stellar. I think they may be the most efficient, high volume ER, 340 patients a day. This is Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth. I had to then wheel the, the wheelchair that said ER into it because otherwise I thought, no one's going to believe me, it looks like a museum lobby. Doesn't it? It's very nice. Well worth, if you're in the area, get them to give you a tour because it's amazing. That's their, their uh, waiting room. Like I say, a little teaser because I'm going to tell you more about them in my next talk tomorrow. But I wanted to show you, if you look, they're an academic teaching hospital. Are you aware of AAAEM? It's all academic hospitals that are sharing performance data and so forth. So if you look, the, the median for the cohort of greater than 100,000, seeing 284 patients a day, when I was doing the study, they did 328 a day at my Texas hospital I'm telling you about. Look at the overall length of stay. Well, the right column, this is my stellar hospital, 177, like less than three hour length of stay for everybody. By the way, their admission rate is almost 30%. Hello, right? Now look at the staffing. If you look at AAM norms, looking at physicians and APPs, not residents, physicians and APPs, 208 hours a day versus 112. Tell me how you see 328 patients a day with only 112 physician hours. <coughs> By the way, they don't use APPs because in their community it's very conservative and the penetration of APPs into that community has been very slow. You can see the staffing is less everywhere. Do my nurses get this, WOPAs? work hours per unit of service. So 3.5 is what the typical academic hospital like this has. They have 2.8. What do you think? That's pretty lean staffing, isn't it? Pretty good for what they're doing there. A teaching hospital, trauma center, all that. This is showing you the nurses have decided they would sit down. The docs stand because they are running. I should say, 328 patients, 112 doc hours, you would be running, wouldn't you? By the way, they have scribes, 
They have scribes. But one of the most interesting things that they have done, oops, here, let me tell you what, the, I, I blew my own uh, thunder here. So that guy has been identified by metrics in his group as either a green doctor, fast, or a slow doctor, red, okay? In their staffing model, they have committed, and they all agreed to this, that they will never put two red doctors overlapping. A lot of them were yellow doctors. They were like right in the middle. <laughs> hey, right, right? And mind you, the way that they staff, they bring on a new provider. I'll tell you actually in detail about it tomorrow, but they bring on a new provider every couple hours almost. So you like the 2 p.m. shift, but you can't work it because there's another red doctor in the noon shift, so you work at 4, right? But they committed. They said, look, we realize we want everybody to work as fast as they can. They've invested, they train, they encourage, they coach. Each doctor, and actually a number of doctors have started out red and are now green by their metrics. They have a, a sort of an eat what you kill model, right, in that patient, uh, the providers are incentivized. So Bill says, you know, I'll never be as fast as Jim, and he, but he makes a little more than me. I'm okay with that, right? But for the sake of the patients and the staff, there's never going to be two bills back to back. You like it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, the data helps to drive this kind of a process. And making doctors efficient, I believe you have to give them a steady diet of data. So to quote Al Capone, you can get a lot farther with a kind word and a gun than with a kind word alone. And I say, in terms of trying to get doctors to move faster, get a lot farther with a kind word and some data than with a kind word alone. So anyway, thank you very much. We've got to do it.